This is a Stock Train Reality Podcast, episode 179. When I first started, I was anxious, excited, fearful, uh, joyful, the full gamut. Today, trading is incredibly boring. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. He uses math and statistics to ease his nervousness when flying. Play Trader. Yeah, this also works out really well when it comes to, uh, to snorkeling or scuba diving, mainly snorkeling uh, and sharks, But uh, which is kind of weird because it'll make some more sense as we go into the podcast, but we had a little discussion about sharks and great whites and all that. But yeah, I like to use stats. I like to use math to ease my nervousness when it comes to situations such as flying or shark attacks. So yeah, I mean, if there's, uh, let's say, 100 people ballpark out there snorkeling and it's my wife and I, it's like, okay, well, I got about a 2% chance that if a, a shark does attack, 2%, I like those odds, I will go snorkeling. And then you look at, of course, the flying statistics. And I've, I'm pretty sure it's like way safer than driving when you look at the math and statistics behind it. So I don't know if either of those situations make you nervous. I know flying does a lot of people, but just use math, use statistics. And when you look at them, you'll quickly realize, wow, I'm a, a lot safer up in the air than I am down on the roads. Um, Chez, who is our steam co-host, by the way, uh, do you use math and statistics in this way to ease nervousness or are you just not a very nervous guy to begin with? So I absolutely do, and I want to plug this book I'm actually listening to on Audible. It's actually called The Science of Fear, and it touches on exactly what you said. Um, people's pretty much how the media or other things can kind of influence your fear where you think like, oh, you know, there was a plane crash, which, which means the next time I get on a plane, I'm probably going to die, when in reality, the chances are super, super small. And just like you said, yeah, I absolutely use statistics and math, and it, it does put me at ease, especially for things I'm kind of uncomfortable with. So. Yeah, I mean, I, it doesn't surprise me at all that you almost know the math of shark attacks for you and your wife both. Um, I shouldn't be surprised at all, but uh, well, I, I, mean, haven't gone, got, I haven't gone that far for the water, though. But that, I mean, you're, you're more of a water skeptic than I. Let me put it this way. If there's only 10 people, I am not going snorkeling because that puts us at a 20% chance. That's like one out of five chance that it could be us if a shark shows up. So I don't know what my break, I don't know where the line is, maybe like 50 or more people. That way it puts the, you know, the odds in, in favor. Clay wants 5,000 people in the water and he wants to be in the <laughs> dead nice center would, surrounded by them. Yeah, how nice would that be? I mean, that's like no chance at all, but you might bring a, a swarm of sharks. What's up? How do sharks travel? It's not swarms. Is it packs? Do I don't even think that exists, does it? I don't know. I think we're going to need to get a marine biologist on the podcast. <laughs> we will. A shark herd? I don't know. I guess if you're listening, <laughs> leave this in the comments section. A gaggle or, of sharks? Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, gaggle. I, I, th this is a... Uh, mind-blowing stuff. But uh, yeah, we do need a marine biologist. Anyways, before we go too much further off topic, we have an awesome interview today. Uh, it is Shirley Mack as he goes by in the chat room. I've met him in Denver. And a little disclosure here, just in the sake of genuineness, uh, Chez and him, as you will discover, are, are, are like legitimate friends. They hang out. So Chez does his best to kind of play stupid. Uh, but you know, as our motto is here, we try to keep this as realistic and as genuine as possible, where it's just a sit down. So yeah, Ches, um, you know, if he seems like, wait a second, it seems like Ches knows the perfect question. He he knows a little bit, but you know, overall, uh, you know, he does a good job of kind of playing dumb. And uh, overall, I like to say overall, apparently, but it was a great interview and one that uh, had me psyched up as an engineer that appreciates logic and kind of sequential thought processes. And uh, surely is very self-aware too. And as I reflect back, that's another good word that I would use to describe this. So without further ado, I'll just say it one more time. Overall, it was a great interview. So let's get to it right now. Sir, there we go. Is it Shirley or Surly? <laughs> it's Surly. Because my wife, and I were having Shirley. A, my wife and I were having this conversation. And I guess, Nate, you could just leave this in the recording because whatever, it's a screw up. But my wife and I were having the conversation and she's like, I'm pretty sure, sure it's Shirley. Like, sure. I know there's no H there, but it's like sure, because there's no sure in S-U-R-E, but you're saying it's surly, right? Surly as in a curmudgeon, someone who's angry and bitter, like an old 70-year-old sitting on this porch yelling at the kid. 
And that's so why like me and him get together. I was going to say, and get like, along so well. Yeah, yeah exactly. get off my get off my lawn to the little three year olds that happen to wander all across to get their ball. So exactly, are, will it throw you off if I call you Shirley? Not at all. It's okay. it's actually what's what's so great about you, play. Okay, good because I know you've got, but in my mind, that's just how it is, and I will screw up as you saw at the intro if I try to say surly. It's just not going to work. So that surly, works right there. surely, they're all one and the same. Um, so we'll, we'll 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 go with that, and um, you know, we'll 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 make it work. No problem. But yeah, surely, welcome to the show, and um, I gotta my my first question has really nothing to do with trading or anything, but. How is your Denver, how to experience Denver the right way, blog, book, mini series? How is that coming? Because I'm telling you as listeners, or really anybody in the chat room, if you are going to Denver and you need something to do, ask Shirley. He will hook you up. When we went for the meetup, um, it was myself, my wife, and then uh, the producer, IT Nate, and his wife. And Shirley was like, hey, try that. Oh, you're look, do that. And you're like four for four, like you nailed it. So how is your Denver travel blog, vlog, book coming? Well, I haven't given much thought, but since you bring it up, I might have to look into it. So I've been here, what, nine years in Denver, and I'm pretty much a foodie, so I get to explore different neighborhoods and have the experience of tasting different kinds of restaurants and stuff like that. Yeah, you absolutely nailed it, that Pol- I can. I remember, what was the name of that Polish place? Kinga's. That's right. Uh, that place was legit, and none of us had really had Polish food before. Uh, but uh, everybody left like, "Oh, Polish food is is actually super good." So uh, thank you for doing that. Yeah. And uh, to listeners out there, Shirley and I have met in the Denver meetup. Um, so this is this is not like total genuineness in the form of like we've never talked before, like most other interviews. But it's still genuine. Whereas I don't know all the nooks and crannies of what we're about to talk about. So with that being said, let's. Uh, Let's start off with the journey. So where did you hear about the markets? What got you interested enough to say, you know what, this market stuff sounds worthwhile enough to want to get more hands-on with. So let's start right there. Uh, well, I've always known about the markets, uh, but I've always felt the markets weren't for, for someone like myself. Uh, I tend to be terrible at math at, and finances and sciences. I'm a social worker by trade, so I deal with emotions and feelings. So um, I've watched movies with you know uh, in the '80s about the stock market and stuff like that, but I never thought it was something that I'd be interested in. And I'd say spring of 2016, summer of 2016, I was just sitting on my couch flipping through YouTube and Google on uh, ways to make money, uh, easy ways of making money. (laughs) Uh, So obviously a lot of links came up and a lot of videos with people with Lamborghinis and uh, selling a product that will show you how to make millions of dollars just from the comfort of your couch. I got to say, I believe the hype. I swallowed the Kool-Aid and I was off to the races uh, the entire summer of 2016, watching videos, opened a Fidelity account, uh, threw some money in it, and threw a lot of money out the window as a result as well. Now, what were you trading at that time to throw this money out the window? (laughs) Uh, Penny stocks. Uh, One of the infamous uh, websites that I got my Kool-Aid experience was on StockWit. Uh, my condolences? Really, like what? I said my condolences. I'm sorry to oh. hear. <laughs> uh, well, I, I got to say, that's where I was found. And I had to go through the trials and tribulations to realize what I was doing is not the way and find something else that works. So yeah, now, I... Go ahead. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here. So I guess... Did you have any kind of initial success trading penny stocks at all? Or was it just kind of you ended up buying the top-ish? I don't know. I only think I'm only able to relate to my personal penny stock experience. So I always bought the top. That was kind of the thing I did. So I lost my butt pretty much right out the get-go. But did you have any kind of initial success, any kind of glimmer of hope that, oh, yeah, this is totally easy and I could do this no problem? 
Oh, but of course I did. I, I am a proud recipient of my uh, participation ribbon in a pump and dump. Uh, uh, I was in preparation for this podcast. I was looking at some of my old trades from that year. Uh, July 26th, uh, the ticker was SPHS. It's a virus bio. It's a pharmaceutical company out of California. Um, yeah, uh, I was on stock twits. Uh, it was one of my favorite tickers that I was genuinely listening to everybody posting on there, how the new tr phase trials are going to be approved by the FDA and how merger talks are happening. And I, I, I genuinely believe all the stories and I got in, I think at four dollars or four and a half dollars uh then july 26th it went to up to eight dollars and 55 cents i believe and i remember that day i was sitting at discount tire getting my tires rotated and i was looking at my phone watching this thing go to the moon and i was giddy with excitement i was like i've made it my bank account's going to be big now, and I'll, I was just jumping up for joy. And then the ticker just started going the other way. And my heart just sank. I was like, what's going on? Oh, my God. No, no. All my dreams uh, are falling apart. And at, all this was happening in the same day, like as you sat at yeah. the tire place? Yep. Oh, yeah, okay. It was towards right. the close. It was towards the close of the market. Gotcha. It was starting to fade, and I'm like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, it'll come back, it'll come back, because I'm watching stock twits, and everybody's posting, don't worry, buy low, average down, uh, you'll be fine. And so I even upped my position, and then if you look at the ticker, each day after that, it was just downhill from 8.55 at its high down to $3. Uh, and... I was morally bankrupt, you could say, at that point. I'm and, just and curious. financially bankrupt too. <laughs> I'm, did they did those phase two trials ever ever get approved or anything? No, no, there there, there was not even it, the phase two trials weren't even being discussed at that time. Okay, so but, and but I, I believe I'm, the hype. Okay, and I guess, and I don't know if you have an answer, but I always find this fascinating. And you're not alone, so it's not like I'm picking on you, but. What, I mean, what made you believe, like I said, I understand if you can't answer it, that people, random strangers on a social media website had any sort of insight into the world of bio or the world of pharma that they knew that these phase two trials were going to get, you know, approved. I mean, because when you stop and think about it, I know in hindsight, you're like, yeah, what was I thinking? But I, do you have any recollection of why you actually believed that random strangers had some sort of like insightful knowledge uh, that we're so confident of, of why or how these trials were going to get approved? Uh, yeah. Uh, the first one was because they sounded like they knew more than I did. So, uh, so there's, there's the sense of authority. And two, and then the second part is that I really wanted it to be true. Like I, I believed my own story in my head. Uh, regardless of how delusional the story was, I bought it hook, hook, line, and sinker. That, Chez, that, make sure you get that quote because that's going in the, the intro because um, I, I kind of set you up in a way, but I didn't know if you were going to actually disclose, but you absolutely nailed the point that I was going to make, so you took the words right out of my mouth. And yeah, sometimes the human mind, as you beautifully put it, I mean, if you want to believe something, it doesn't really matter how irrational it becomes. You're just going to believe because, well, you want to believe it. So, yeah, absolutely. You nailed it. And um, I guess kind of irritating at the same time because, like I said, you stole my thunder. I thought I was going to make, the, make that <laughs> point. But you were too rational. You were too honest about it. And, yeah, so as listeners out there, just be very aware of that. Always be asking yourself, am I believing something because it's truly logical, it's truly rational, or am I believing it? Just because I, I just want it to be so true that I'm willing to make all sorts of jumps of logic to, to, to make the thought process come true. And I mean, I'm kind of, I, I hold this flag proud. I mean, I'm king of the mountain. At least yours was like pharma, cutting edge, 
phase two trials. So you have a legitimate excuse. For me, I was thinking that about stainless steel mufflers as uh, you know, long time <laughs> wishes now. So I mean, at least yours wasn't totally irrational. Like mine was extremely, extremely irrational. But uh, yeah, I, I and that was also I found it interesting. People post. Did you have that Ches when you were on the social media where people they they talk in a way that almost grants them authority? So because of that, you just automatically believed what they had to say. Did Did you have any? Um, uh, can you I relate mean, to that point? Yeah, I absolutely can. But this I've. I've had a just a recent epiphany in terms of like what does it take to call yourself an expert or something and just looking at somebody's Twitter profile and they're like expert in this or expert <laughs> in so, that. I'm yeah, kind of like so... this is such a joke, but here's the thing. The mind is such a tricky thing in the sense that you will always look for things that confirm kind of your outlook or your bias. Exactly. Is that you're like, oh, he's an expert on stock twits. Like I'm so happy that this expert is here to literally confirm my opinion. So yeah, I absolutely did. But I think that, I mean, that, that happens in so many different things in life too. But yeah, especially in trading. It's uh but yeah, just recently I've been looking at people with the word expert in their profiles and I'm like, oh geez. I just yeah. So yep, I absolutely did the same thing. That's right. actually I never okay. thought about that, but that is a great epiphany because literally when you think about it, we'll, we'll we'll assume that they're even just a one finger typer. So they're not like a super fast typer. But even in that case, it takes them what, like three seconds to punch out expert and then hit enter and all of a sudden to some people, like you said, oh, they're an expert all of a sudden. Oh, interesting. I've been trading for three months. I'm a Forex expert. I yeah. manage $100 million. I'm like, okay, let's uh, let's let's go back a little bit here. But yeah, exactly. It doesn't take much to type it into your profile. Yeah, that's- And uh, it was always the guys that uh, that uh, posted hundreds of times. So there was this always, with frequency, obviously they knew what they were talking about. No, that's actually super interesting too, is they right. gained authority just because, well, they're talking about it so much, so they must be really involved. They must be, uh, when in all actuality, they're probably the people that are either really underwater or they're the people that are currently sitting right on the offer and just waiting for somebody to, to hit the offer, so uh, for somebody to buy their shares. But awesome, yeah. that was a great little sidetracked rabbit hole there. That's that's the name yeah. of the game. So, all right, you, uh, let's see, you were morally bankrupt or you were morally, I can't remember the way you put it, but your morale morally was- Morally bankrupt. And financially, because I, that was the it was all the money that I, I I was able to put into the market, and I was devastated because I believed it so much that I it, I was crushed that it totally went against me, and so I still stuck with stock with, and I I wasn't giving up although I didn't have any money to trade, and I kept on seeing your videos. Uh, in in stock with, and you were one of those experts that frequently posts, you know. So when I watched your videos, there was something different. You weren't uh, a showboat, or you weren't a braggart about your talents or anything. You presented information in a pretty dry and methodical <laughs> way. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, and so it piqued me a curiosity. And the other thing that piqued my curiosity was that everyone hated you um, on StockTwit. Uh, as soon as you posted a video, there were just like an army of people saying how this stock is going to tank now and you have an army of shorters in Somalia and all of these wonderful <laughs> stories. And I think this was September or late August, and I had this epiphany. Why would I not spend a hundred bucks and join this shorting army? I mean, this was my get rich quick scheme. That's the same sort of thought pattern that I had getting into this. Is if this guy really has a shorting army, why would I not make easy money by joining this army, whether it's legal or not? So September, I get on your website and I start chatting with Chaz through the little blue box. And the first or second question out of my mouth is, are you guys really a shorting army? If so, how do I get in on it? To which I promptly blocked him and uh, <laughs> somehow he got around our filters. It must have changed an IP or something, but... Uh... 
Yeah, did I, you really, Chez, or are you just joking around? No, with that? I, I, I didn't, I did not block. Okay, I mean, because I wouldn't have blamed you no, if somebody no. was like, "Hey, <laughs> I want to join the shorting army." I mean, I wouldn't blame you for the. Okay, so I wasn't. No, sure. No, no, I, I like to open people's eyes and kind of talk about more about what we, what we actually do here versus that. But um, yeah, I, I like to think I was pretty nice to you. I don't know, did I come off no too hostile? I, I, I'm not. I don't remember. I talked to people. You all were time. very professional, and you you challenged me. You said, "Look, uh, if you think we're a shorting army." me or, or, or if we're, you think we're BS and somehow one way to find out is to pay the $99 for the inner circle if you're not ready to commit to the university. Pretty, you know, just the back and forth dialogue. And I said, you know what? I lost uh, the thousands of dollars listening to stock with what's another $100 if I'm wrong. Uh, so I joined inner circle and I quickly realized that you guys were nothing like uh, the people on Stockwood say you guys are. Uh, not like 180 degrees opposite of of what how you're described. Uh, everyone's uh, serious. Everyone is, um, you know, this is a business. This is how a lot of us make money. This is how a lot of us make a secondary income. This isn't about Lamborghinis. This is about... Uh, freedom of you know from financial burden uh and there was everyone had this tone of we're happy to help you if you're willing to help yourself uh and that's you know and it didn't take i think september is when i joined inner circle and then i think it was not early november when i joined the university uh so but it was about a month and a half of sitting in inner circle and just listening to like the old timers like Alex, Sean, Mr. B, Hooch, all these guys and girls talking about, you know, their journey and, you know, some people joining the inner circle and asking for alerts and, or asking for tips, uh, uh, this and that. And it was like, it's not so much that it's what's your entry, what's your exit. What, you know what time frame are you on? Where and so it was. It, it became obvious that as um, there's a certain level of of professionalism and in the inner circle, especially during trading hours, that was completely different than stock with. So that's kind of was the selling point, the turn them around point that Clay is serious about teaching me how to participate in the stock market. Period. Simple and. It was up to me to take that information and do with it what I what I chose to do with. Either take it seriously or or you know mess around and just haphazardly take effort in. So I I need to I need to commend you on your common sense logic. That's apparently not very common to go back to. Well, wait a second here. So there's this guy who has a shorting army and like. According to some people, every single time he posts a video, that stock is going down, like every single time. But I can join the shorting army for just $100. So if it goes down every single time and it's only $100, I'll make a lot more than that because this is like the holy grail. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I commend your logic, but it's amazing how many people <laughs> throw out all these <laughs> accusations and you're like, do you realize what you're saying? According to you, you found the holy grail. So why are you not taking advantage of the holy grail? Exactly. And it, it, it goes back to the whole confirmation bias. And like you said earlier, it's like if people want to believe something, they're going to believe it in the exact way that fits into their belief system. And they just want to believe it enough where they can blame anybody else. But push them any further. Uh, well, I mean, uh, and they're not they never have an answer for that. But uh, I, I, I a pe more people need that sort of logic. Whereas if I mean, nobody's listening, I don't think. But if you believe that we have a shorting army, then why would you not join? Join us. It's only a hundred bucks, and if it if we're a curse on every stock, then it sounds like easy money to you. But uh, people never join that. But anyways, that that's you have a very you have a very logical mind, and as a as an engineer, I I really appreciate that. So you get the university, and I love what you said. Look, Clay's going to give me the tools. Clay's going to give me the information. Clay's going to give me what I need. But it's up to me to take that and then go and apply it to you know fit into you know what I'm trying to do with it. So right. what exactly were you looking to do at that point in time? I mean, were you focused on stocks? Were you focused on options? Were you thinking of some, maybe you're still, uh, your idea was I got to learn how to trade penny stocks. 
But after you signed up, what was kind of your, your priorities in terms of what you wanted to take with that information and use it for? Well, the, I, I need to back up a little because before university, I actually bought robotic trading. And because I was still, the university was just not financially feasible at that time. And that, that was also the other wake-up call because robotic trading was just the tip of the iceberg. And I realized quickly how much I didn't know and how dangerous I was uh, with not knowing. But then... The tip of robotic trading also showed me that there's just so much beyond what this initial course is that I'm even more dangerous by having one course and and being sort of arrogant and, and still having this thought in the back of my head of the holy grail and get rich quick kind of mentality that I soon after I went through robotic trading, I realized, okay, now what? I have a little bit, but I can't progress any further at this point without being in, in a dangerous place to blow up my account again. So at first, I was doing uh, like stocks under 10, uh, not too much. For some reason, I, I jumped into options really quickly. They, uh, I watched your uh, penny stocks on steroids. Uh, and it just seemed like the better option to participate in tickers that are well traded, well established, you know, in the market and have sort of uh, stable liquid liquidity. So options what became the the choice of of trading. Um, but I I was still losing money because I want to go back to the point where. You gave me the tools, but it was up to me to to really use them. So I got to say for the first three or four months, I got the tools from you, but I was, you know, I was swinging the hammer with, with the handle, trying to nail the nail with the handle rather than the head. I wasn't giving it the respect that the market demands of you and that the tools demand of you and how you use them. So, so I, I really like how you kind of put that, but kind of spell it out for listeners here. What do you mean by that? Did you not practice enough? Were you not, were you just kind of, did you, was getting education kind of like a check mark and now you're just kind of free to exactly like you said, use the handle of the hammer instead of the actual head of the hammer? What, just kind of let people know what you mean. Um, I was eyeballing trend lines. Uh, I was... Um eyeballing stop losses rather than actually drawing out uh, on the chart. Uh, I was uh, entering trades at any time on the top and not really or, or look, uh, looking to day trade but use, or uh, having uh, swing trades but using the intraday time frames like five minutes. So I was just all over the place. Um, I was... Uh, Placing more money on the line than I should. Uh, I was, yeah, I was wild and loose with with everything. Um, that was kind of. I had the tools, but uh, you recommended. You always recommend uh, paper trading. Uh, for some reason, paper trading was just a yawn fest. Uh, I didn't give it the respect necessary, and I kept on. I was somewhat smart and used the tools, but I was still losing money because uh, I was just not respecting the trade plan or I had a loosely established trade plan. So it sounds like you you got some education and that that swung the pendulum as far as confidence to being way too confident. Is that kind of a fair summary of essentially what happened? Uh, yeah, cockiness. Um, I had the CTU badge. I was a participant in, in the chat. Uh, I, I had familiarity with a lot of the tickers and what they're doing. But quite honestly, I, I wasn't paying it the respect necessary. I was pretty arrogant with having the education. I was, yeah. That, that, that's super interesting. I mean, it makes perfect sense, but uh, I can see, hey, I've taken... I've I've taken education, I've taken these online courses, so now it's almost like you're entitled to start to have success because you've put in the time. 
But like you said earlier, uh, the market demands more respect than just that. Now you're making all these comments in hindsight, but back in the moment, did you have a, a trade? Did you have a string of trades? What actually kind of slapped you across the face and said, hey, you're getting way too cocky. You're getting way too overconfident. I kept on losing money. Um, and from an emotional standpoint, uh, it's I had the gambler's excitement. Um, I could feel my heart accelerating and beating. Um, I would check my phone every two minutes. I I would like literally check the market at two o'clock in the morning to see what ES was doing when I didn't even have a trade on ES. Um, I was worried and not falling asleep because I had an overnight trade that I shouldn't have had on or was too big for for my portfolio. And I, I was biting my nails and then waking up before the market opened just so I could, you know, try to catch it and it, it, it stave off some losses. So I was literally, I had, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced those kind of highs um, uh, with with gambling. Um, but pretty much I, you know, I was, I was gambling with money and it was exciting and it made the blood flow, but I was still losing money. And that was, you know, heartbroken every single time. And I was beating myself up and all sorts of things. Yet I had the tools, but somehow I wasn't using them with the respect that they need. Out of curiosity, when you were waking up early or not being able to fall asleep, was that derived from stress or is that derived from excitement, like like you were describing, the gambler's excitement? Both. Um, okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd say all of it, like the, the full full gamut of, of emotions, excitement, anxiety, uh, wishful thinking that I'll be able to buy a Lamborghini tomorrow or I'll be living under a, a bridge tomorrow, all of it, just like my mind would perseverate on on these trades or on the red in my account and how much I'm losing and hoping that it bounces back rather than getting out of it, uh, things like that. And then I I can I can relate and I mean it's it's miserable. Would you? I mean, in hindsight, isn't that? I mean, that was a miserable probably. How long did this last? I mean, was this a couple of weeks, couple of months? What was the time period? I uh, probably I'd say. Spring to summer of last year, um, they, they, it was exhausting. I, I would yeah, it, say it was. It's probably it, mis it was a miserable period, wasn't it? it? It's got to it, be with the, the the all the voices and all those emotions. You, it, it, that's an understatement. Misery is an <laughs> understatement. But yeah, it was literally um, because it was more frustrating than before I joined. Because on stock twits, at least I had the excuse of ignorance. And I was just throwing money out the window. Here, I no longer had an excuse of ignorance, but I was sort of still sort of like just flagrantly abusing the system that you, that I paid for and should be taking seriously. And the, just to clarify, the system meaning general sets of rules that you need to follow, but within the, those rules... I mean, you can, you know, there's, there's wiggle room to build a strategy that fits for your personal risk tolerance. I, I just don't yeah. want, uh, you know, I don't want people to think like, wait, Clay, you always bash a system, not system over our, you know, big rules. You got to be able to put together a trade plan. And then from there, you know, there's lots of nooks and crannies. So what, what was finally, I mean, you kept losing money, you kept losing money, but what was the kind of the line in the sand that was it you ran out of money or did you just, I mean, you know, I've had enough of this. What was the, I've had enough of this moment that, you know, uh, I'm assuming helped you pivot in your journey? Uh, that would be Chez. Um, so Chez ended up moving out to Colorado last year. And uh, through the chat, he and I started chatting. And then we went camping a bunch of times and hiked a couple of mountains together. And he really sort of, I would say tutored me um, things that not only so drawing a trend line is easy enough. Drawing, uh, you know, putting in a stop loss is easy enough. However, sort of adhering to those things when the gremlins in your head start telling you, "Oh, 
the price is making going higher, you you can get more profits than you're you're keeping the trade on when you shouldn't keep the trade on. So the emotional attachment and the, the emotional maturity necessary to respect the trade plan um, just wasn't there for me. And I think the chatting and talking with Chaz and that was sort of the turnaround point where like I needed to slow down psychologically. I needed to slow down emotionally. I needed to sort of just start small and have one thing at a time and come to the realization that I'm not going to make this a grow rich quick thing that this is not about buying Lamborghini um, so that over that summer over that course of that summer was sort of the I started paying attention sort of with a little bit more seriousness to what the market demands of you in order for you to be successful in the market. That's good stuff. Now, I knew that you and Chez were hanging out. Um, I know you posted a couple cool like gun, vi gun videos you guys shooting and stuff like that. But I, I was not quite aware that there was some, um, some uh, maturing going on out in the woods and up in the mountains. So I guess my <laughs> question for you, Chez, is how did this go from your perspective? Was it surely just kind of uh, not necessarily pouring out his feelings, but just kind of speaking his mind and then you just absorbed it and gave like little bits of Yoda wisdom or was this just uh, a lot of back and forth? I mean, how did this all break down from your side of things? I'm very curious because I was, uh, you know, genuinely I was not aware that this is how everything played out. Oh, I mean, he was crying the whole time. <laughs> I had to kind of hold him in my arms and comfort him and stuff. Do you have to make him a no, s'more honestly, around the campfire? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That and uh, brought and some other stuff, yeah. but yeah. So I think the, the whole thing was, is that Surly actually used to apologize. Like you might talk about this stuff for like, as long as we did. And we just spent hours talking about trading, but the whole thing is that I've kind of been involved in this space for longer than him. So just exactly what he was saying right there is I was kind of like, you know, this is a, this is the long game. Like it's not something that's going to come overnight. Um, I get it, that whole quote, you know, you only need to get rich once, whatnot. I'm like, we don't play, you know, the game of lottery tickets. I mean, you're more than welcome to do that if you want. But then I just kind of talked about my strategy and advanced options and stuff like that. Slow and steady wins the race. So um, to me, it was absolutely no problem at all because I love talking trading and I usually have nobody else to talk with it, you know, outside of our chat room or Twitter or something else like that. But um, at the same time, you know, it didn't feel like any kind of work to me, not only because I like talking about it, but at the same time, Surly was opening my eyes to kind of all the camping opportunities and stuff. So while he was, he might be learning something from me, I was learning a bunch of stuff about Colorado because I had just gotten here. I think I met Surly maybe four months after I moved here. So I really didn't know anything about it. So to me, it was totally like a mutual type thing. And like I said, I, I always like talking about training. So it's never a big deal. Yeah, who knew you had like the best tour guide in Denver or the state of Colorado at your fingertips. Um, so Oh, yeah, that, right from the get-go yeah, too. That, so that sounds like a win-win combination. And usually that's where friendships oh, yeah. are formed if uh, each person can compliment one another. Now, surely Ches brought up, he was telling you about advanced options. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Is this where your interest in advanced options sparked from in, in, at this junction in your journey? Yeah. Um, I would say for, I had some interest in advanced options because of defined risk. Uh, I think one of my difficulties when trading, emotional response is having undefined risk. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've only been trading probably for the going on two two years now um so there's the biggest lesson for me is more the emotional and psychological less so the technical aspect of trading um but with advanced options sort of the it, it's it's safe uh it feels safe to have a defined risk trade on because i know right from the get-go the max amount that i can lose uh and so I can decide whether that's the tolerant, whether I can tolerate that loss or not. 
uh, and preemptively. So before I even put on the trade, I know how much I'm going to lose. Should I should the trade I mean, go again? Absolutely, and it's not the reason why I kind of got involved in in trading kind of short options and spreads and stuff like that was the same exact reason. Um, it's not that we don't trust ourselves; it's that I know if absolutely everything goes haywire to Sigma Summer, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's I know the max amount I can lose. And when I kind of tell people this, sometimes they're kind of baffled. They're like, "What do you mean if something moves against you know fifty dollars, you only lose you know two hundred bucks or whatever?" And I'm, it's pretty much as simple as it's all about how you structure stuff. So that's what appealed to me. Um, I kind of. I think I kind of talked, I definitely talked about this around a bonfire with you, but that was kind of my first introduction to the benefits they have. And then at the same time, I'm like, I just kind of know it's a numbers game. The Greeks are all pretty much, you're, you're looking at it from like a casino standpoint. You kind of get to, to look behind the door and see what other kind of quote unquote, we'll go back to this experts term again, whatever the market makers and everybody is kind of pricing in for moves. So to me, I was like, I, it kind of is an advantage by no means. Am I going to hit, you know, multiple thousand percent winners being long an option at earnings or something if you really catch a break. But at the same time, I'm like, I can make, you know, 30% in a year that the fund managers would kill their mothers for having a return like that. So I was like, that's, so that was kind of the things that I really enjoyed about advanced options. I'm just glad that you kind of enjoyed it too. But yeah. I know you definitely kind of started dabbling more into it. But correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you find some initial success trading spreads? And then um, did you have some setbacks and you took a little break and came back? Or am I wrong? Well, it's a, so it, last year was more of a flat year where I had successes and then I had losses. I mean, I think the, one of the biggest uh, lessons, one of the biggest uh, learning things that I, I did last year was uh, you have time. Uh, one of the things that Chez always uh, beat into me through chat is that I don't like to see red. Uh, and with a, and sometimes the trade is going against you, but it's, if it's within your trade plan, don't react. Uh, and sitting on my hands, was hard for me, not being reactive to to the red numbers on my screen. Um, so I, I had successes, then I had losses, uh, and then I had some successes and losses. So last year, I was kind of I finished flat. Um, yeah, and so financially it was flat, but like psychologically, the lessons kept on building on themselves. You know, the technical analysis is there, but um, my relationship with money uh, and my relationship with what that with money means to me. And uh, yeah, those are those have been the lessons of the past year and a half. Uh, which I, I, I will say my that goes. I, I got to cut you off here because there's people probably screaming at you right now saying, what is this Yahoo talking about? <laughs> I'm losing all kinds of money. And he's sitting there saying, well, I was flat for the year. I, I And Chez, I don't remember, but you've always said it from like podcast one, but what's the cycle? You lose money to break even to then making money. Is what, What's what's your saying that you've always said that apparently I can't remember? You need to be, yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> going to break even is the first step towards profitability. But most people go, oh, I'm only break even. I'm like, you don't understand. You're halfway up the hill right, right. now. Exactly. Like more people struggle with that than anything. Yeah. So um, I would, I mean, I'm not saying you're ungrateful there, Shirley, but I, I would, I, I, what I'm, I'm trying to encourage you, don't discredit yourself too much because a lot of people would be very, very happy, um, you know, at break even, heck, uh, today randomly, but uh, uh, HMNY is just getting, Toasted right now as uh, you know we record this, but uh, some kid was messaging me on Instagram and he he sent me a screenshot of his account and I'll just put it this way: he is not going to be break even on the year unless something drastically changes. So break even, a lot of people would like to be there, uh, but like you said, I mean within the break even, you got all those experiences that it sounds like yeah. help build you up. Now you also made a comment about your experience or your relationship with money. Um, can you d dig a little bit deeper into that? What exactly did you mean uh, with that comment? Well, you know, um, I grew up in a single parent home uh, and we are immigrants. Uh, so my mother kind of lived a life of keeping up with the Joneses. And 
you know, the American dream. We came from a communist country and we ended up going to grocery stores here in America that had an entire aisle of cereals. So <clears throat> I grew up with, with, with a certain type of relationship of what money is, what money does. And um, that, I think, is what got me into trading, that, that old story. Um, but over that last year, I'm, I'm re, reinventing or re, relearning my relationship with what money is and what it does for you. Uh, and I think that's where my sort of success has started is because I'm not chasing that Lamborghini anymore. I'm not sort of my, my goals and my desires for financial stability aren't about Lamborghinis. Uh, they're about something else. And I, I think you bring up a kind of a very big point here. And for full disclosure, for any listeners out there, you know, me and Surly know each other. I've known him for a good a bit of time now and I kind of watched him progress through his trading. But define what you mean by you kind of you're not going for Lambos and whatnot. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. What you're really saying is that you found a strategy that works, things you're comfortable with, and you're kind of pressing your edge. Am I wrong in saying that? Hey, what do you mean pressing my edge? You know where you're capable of making money and where you feel comfortable doing it and just kind of the process. By no means are you just kind of going willy-nilly, throwing short calls or puts around, are no, you? No, no, not at all. Um, I actually, for the majority of this year, I've been following only one picker. Um, and I've And just recently in the past month or so, I've, I've gone and ventured into other tickers. But I would say SPX is is the is the one thing that sort of I'm the most romantic with, uh, and I and I have a strategy of what works, and by no means, and I'm uh, I'm raking in hundreds of dollars uh, a day by, but you know what, the little crumbs keep adding up, and uh, I think my goal now is that laying my head down at night and sleeping comfortably. Uh, not having that anxiety about this or that, uh, not having worry. Uh, I think that's that financial freedom that I'm in search of, less so of the, what finances can bring to me. Sleeping, sleeping comfortably at night is very important to me. And especially when you have the baseline and the reference point of that uh, beyond miserable part of your life where you are not sleeping very easily um, at life. And I want to just piggyback a comment. The crumbs are adding up. And of course, you meant that from a monetary value. What I would notice is the good habits are also adding up. So sure, they're just small monetary wins. But I, and I'm assuming that all this is being done with good habits, good habits, good. Ha in fact, I know they're being done with good habits because if you're out, you know, breaking rules, if you're out doing silly things, then yeah, you would probably have some pretty big gains, but you would also have some big old swings too to the downside. But if everything is slowly adding up, slowly adding up, that also tells me that, and most importantly, are the good habits are building up. My question before I forget is, uh, where did the SPX come from? What 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 drew your attention? Um, and it clearly fits your personal risk tolerance levels, and it's within those um, you know th those margins. But where where did this even you know come about? Uh, well, so. Uh... SPY, you know, is the most traded ETF in the world, uh, and SPX is an index of, of ES. What I liked about SPX, I think, we, Ches and I, went to a meetup group in Denver, and we, for a couple of times, and talked about different strategies with other folks. And this one gentleman brought up his strategy of just doing SPX trades, like 10 deltas, like 10 lots, and he's just raking in small bits of money, but putting up a lot. And I think Chaz had some success with SPX and some not so successful experiences with SPX, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, it's definitely been a love hate. I'll give you that. <laughs> uh, but the thing is that the biggest thing for me that it takes away is that it's cash settled. 
versus spy, which is not cash settled. Uh, there's no shit. Now ex- explain that for the listeners here because people are going to be like, what do you mean by cash shell? Yeah. I have no idea what that means. So should SPY, if you're holding a SPY option, should it be exercised or assigned? You have to buy 100 shares of a SPY. And then you're, if you don't have it, then you go into a call. Uh, with SPX, you're, it's cash settled, meaning you are for every penny is a dollar. So if you it goes against you or you're at max loss, you're at max loss four hundred dollars. You don't have to buy four hundred shares of spy. Um so it took a lot of fear out of trading for me by doing the SPX. Um and um the premiums are a little bit higher on SPX than they are on SPY. Uh, and the commission rates are a little bit higher, but it, you end up paying less commission um, because it's only one trade versus a two or three lot with SPY. Uh, there's also tax advantages to SPX, the 60-40 split long-term capital gains versus short-term capital gains versus SPY. Um, so I, didn't, I don't think I conscientiously and intentionally kind of like oh, SPX is going to be my thing. I, I was just testing different strategies and trying new things and seeing what, what was working, what wasn't. And SPX sort of kind of where everything came into focus. Um, and and correct me if I'm wrong here, the reason why it being cash settled is mainly more so a function of it helps you sleep better at night. Is that wrong? Yes. Um, gotcha. The moral of the entire story is when I first started, I was anxious, excited, fearful, uh, joyful, the full gamut. Today, trading is incredibly boring. Um, I almost sometimes don't want to open up a chart and look at it. You know, I, 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 love, I love trading and I love the opportunities that it, it does. But it's become, not but. And it's become sort of the second job. And I think that's the biggest lesson is by being, by doing my job, uh, trend line, stop losses, entry and exit points, uh, knowing what my max loss is and not going above and beyond what I'm willing to lose has taken all of that excitement of the casino kind of energy of the stock market completely out of the equation. And it's now just, for lack of a better word, play. It's robotic. Um, it's just I, I, I open up the charts for a half an hour. I see what I'm going to do. I put it on. I close the computer, and I'm done. Uh, Let me ask this. I'm, I'm curious, and this Chez, same question to you, and then I'll give you my answer. Do you look forward to Monday mornings for the stock market? I'll let you go first. I do. Early. Actually, I look for I look forward to Sunday at 4 p.m. Okay, because no, uh, futures or whatever open up then? <laughs> yes. And then, Chez, what about you? Do you look forward to Monday morning? Uh, I wouldn't say I dread it, but it's just I sleep in on Sunday, so I usually don't look forward to Mondays. But no, that, that whole novelty of like when Friday the market closes, by, I've, I've lost that whole thing of, oh, darn, I can't believe it's the weekend, because here's the thing. Similar to kind of Surly, what he was saying, um, I do my work Monday through Friday and I kind of go from there. Like I enjoy my weekend. So I spend, I work hard five days a week and then I like to enjoy the weekend. So by no means do I feel like I'm at a loss or I'm really clawing for the market to get back over. But, That's but just you, me though. It's, it's been a couple but, of years. No, you used to be the person you're like, oh, it's Friday. Oh, I hate the weekends now because I love the market so much. That, that part is come and gone. That part is coming yeah. gone because trading is now kind of boring, mechanical, and uh, I know what I'm kind of getting into. And I that, that's a strength, though. That's something I definitely am excited about. But there's no more excitement. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, so my answer is I love Fridays because Friday means it's the weekend and I don't have to stare at this uh-huh. thing called the stock market for a while. Um, so I'm all for it. Does that mean I hate my job? Does that mean I hate trading? No, absolutely not. But uh, no. to Shirley's point, which kind of you know spur this on, it's... That's to me kind of a little trick I've learned in the coaching, teaching, whatever business you want to call me in is when people show up in the chat room, they're like, oh man, it's Friday. I, ah, I got to wait till Monday. It's like, I have a feeling that 
you're flying a little bit too far by the or too you know much by the seat of your pants because you really um i mean I, I think you can tell a lot by if you're just like all right yep it is what it is oh good the weekend i can take a break from this stuff but but i i, I was there too like I was literally disappointed Friday at 4 p.m. I'm like, man, I got to wait all the way till Monday now. Oh, what am I going to do all weekend? All the excitement's gone. But that's like the exact opposite of how it should be. And it's hard to explain yeah. because, yeah, you have to have a passion about it. But uh, you have to not. So, surely it sounds like you're getting there. But if you're still looking forward to Monday and you're looking forward to Sunday. Uh, but to be fair, is that maybe more so just a function of how your strategy works? Or is it more of you're just so excited to get there? Uh, it's a curiosity. Um, it's, you know, I'm not thinking on Saturday afternoon, I'm not thinking where the ES is going to open on Sunday. Um, it's sort of like I do, uh, I make my lunches for the week on Sunday, or I meal prep on Sunday, or for the week, or I figure out what tasks I have to schedule for for, on, for the week on Sunday. So it's more preparatory in nature rather than biting my fingernails at 3.30 uh, waiting for it to open. Um, it gives, because I typically prepare my charts to see what my SPX or other trades are going to be on, I go to a coffee shop on Sunday afternoon and I, I can, I get a sense, I guess, I get a, a feeling of where we might be heading. Okay, so it's 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 definitely part of a strategy. It's part of a routine. It's not like you're just doing it just because oh, I can't wait. Let's go. It's it's definitely dare I say boring. It sounds like your approach is kind of boring. Like okay, I'm just going and do start my homework, and so it's it's definitely part of a bigger system. My final question yeah. before uh, Ches uh, lends you his time machine is: I'm curious, uh, what. How complicated is your chart? I mean, are you using charts? Or are you just using the Greek? I mean, if I were to sit down next to you and, and see your chart, what exactly uh, is on it? Uh, 10, simple moving average, Bollinger Bands, which is the 20, uh, 50, 200, RSI. That's it. RSI. Yeah, that's it. So the moving averages and RSI. And then I'm assuming candlesticks too, right? Just well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, people always forget that, but technically candlesticks are an indicator <laughs> in and of themselves. A very powerful right. indicator compared to like Chez's favorite, the line chart. I'm, I'm kidding, Chez. Relax, buddy. Relax. <laughs> relax <laughs> calm down. But uh, good. I, point Chez, figure. Right? All the way. <laughs> yeah, point. That thing's a classic. That is an absolute classic. But sounds like nothing, uh, nothing too complicated on Shirley's chart. Kind of the way we like it around nope. here. Keep it simple, stupid. Yep, kiss. Uh, yep. I mean, absolutely. when it, at the beginning it was a lot. It was a lot more. Oh my god, it was so much more. Uh, MACD, RSI, uh, all sorts of things. But then I was just like, I can't see anything. I can't see the chart. <laughs> I, I can't see the candlesticks. So I got to take some stuff away. So. Yeah, I got five different oscillators that take up most of my screen. And then the actual price is, you know, one fifteenth of the screen resolution. Exactly. So, I mean, who needs yeah, price? Yeah, don't forget about Andrew's pitchfork, whatever stuff. that one thing's called. I mean, you got to have that on your chart, too. <laughs> but uh, Right. Yeah, Pink Floyd laser show. I mean, you got a whole bunch of indicators these days. But, um, certainly, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank, Thank you for you. taking time this evening to talk with us. But I do know the real reason you came on today was to borrow my time machine. And if you were to use it... And give yourself one piece of advice. What would that advice be? Wow. Um, take it more seriously. Um, yeah. Uh, or start sooner. Um, but take it more seriously from the get-go. Uh, give it the respect, the respect that it demands. Uh, without giving it the respect, you're not going to be successful. And you're not going to be successful in a whole lot of things, not just the stock market. That if you don't give it the respect that anything you put your attention and resources to, it's just not going to. I, I love it. I love that answer. That's that's good stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it really does boil down to respect in so many different ways, which you did a great job of uh, articulating here over the past hour or so. But with that being said, mm -hmm. it's time for some serious stuff. Shirley, what is your favorite movie? Princess Bride. My wife, oh man, my wife. She did remember <laughs> you, by the way, and we were just, she's like, oh yeah, 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 and but uh, she would, now she would remember you that much more. 
Uh, what's the oh, line? That's a classic. Want a peanut? Isn't that from yeah. The Princess Bride? Or am I just? I don't remember that one. But uh, <laughs> rodents <laughs> of unusual size or have fun storming the castle. Yeah. Or uh, inconceivable. There we. Uh, inconceivable yeah, there is always we, yeah, a classic yeah. one. Chez, you're up, sir. But. Um, Mr. Shirley, I know you know a lot of good food places yep. all around this region. So if you had to pick your favorite food and dessert, what would it be? Oh, favorite food would be uh, Giordano's Pizza from Chicago. Uh, star, oh. Sorry, Colorado. Oh. But the good news is that uh, actually Giordano's is opening up in uh, in Denver, downtown Denver. So well, guess, I, guess I'm selling my house. Yep. Giordano's Pizza would be favorite food. Uh, favorite dessert? Uh, what? Oh my God! Uh, sea salt caramel ice cream in a waffle cone. Yeah, sea salt caramel in a waffle cone. You're definitely a foodie when you when you break down the context all the way to the <laughs> cone. That's good. That's that, that's great stuff. What about? I like food. Um, actually, I'm going to ask this because I, I think you already gave away your hobbies. You like outdoors, camping, all that sort of stuff. And we haven't asked this question in forever. But if you could travel anywhere in the world, where is one place you would like to visit someday? South Africa to do some uh, scuba diving with great white shark. Yeah, you're a psycho. I was going to say, why would you go to South Africa and then you bring up scuba dive? And I'm like, don't you know about the great white sharks? And then because you want to, you want to <laughs> scuba dive with the great white sharks. So uh, don't invite me on that trip. You're inviting I will, Claire, uh, right? Yeah, I will. I will. Oh. I will pass. <laughs> it's in the cage. Hard you will pass. be safe. Haven't you ever seen movies where the cage breaks? I mean, I've watched plenty of... Uh, Clay is an engineer is checking the tensile strength <laughs> yeah. of the so locks and all this other stuff. Checking yeah. the well, details. all that good stuff. Minor details. Yeah. I could think of worse ways of, of dying than being eaten by a shark. Uh, I mean, I can too, but still, I, I don't think it's a very pleasant one. But uh, regardless, <laughs> we won't go down that path. Um, like I said, thanks again for taking time yeah, out of your no evening. Problem. But if you had to pick three words that you think define successful trading, what would those three words be? Uh, uh, respect, patience, uh, and community. There you go. I like that because uh, the community is uh, is very important. It's one that'll, uh, yeah. Build you up when you need to be built yeah. up. Keep you humble. Yep. Smack you across yep. the face if you need to be smacked across the face. And uh, that's so exactly. yeah, that's that, that's a really good word for sure. Because trading can be a lonely business um, if you allow yes, it sir. to be. Some people strive under that, and that's cool. But I I really learned I like to shoot the breeze and just uh, have a community component. Um, and so yeah, that's a great lineup of words. And overall, a great uh, discussion. I'm a little jaded and a little bitter. I don't know what took you so long to get on here. But I appreciate you finally reaching out to us. Uh, as always, that makes our life much easier. So I thank you for that. And uh, we'll have you back one way or the other, whether you like it or not. But I I'm, I'm excited. I like you. You're a good guy. You're a great tour guy. Thank you. Uh, so I, it, it's, it's refreshing. It's uh, encouraging. And yeah, it's just awesome that, uh, sure, the crumbs you're making, but the crumbs are adding up. But most importantly, yes, sir. the good habits are adding up, whether you want to realize that or not. But that's okay. When good habits build up, Good habits don't care what you think, they're habits. And before you know it, it sounds like it's already becoming a routine and a very boring routine at that, as we already discussed. So right. good stuff, Shirley. Will you come back again? Absolutely. All right, perfect, perfect. Well, Thank you for having me. You are, you are more than welcome. For you listeners out there, before we go, a final few things. If you are listening to this on YouTube, make sure to check out the channel as a whole. Lots of other videos, there's a vlog, quick tip videos, live trade videos, so check all that stuff out. Hope you decide to ultimately subscribe to the channel. If you are listening to this on iTunes or any of the other podcast players, uh, make sure to subscribe. And especially on iTunes, if you could leave us a rating, that really helps us out, that really goes a long way. And even if you never spend a dime on anything we have to offer, that, that's fine, no hard feelings. But if you could just help us out with a, if a rating if you enjoy this, uh, that is definitely appreciated. And then finally, if you're listening at claytrader.com on the show notes page, leave us a comment, click that share button. We will read them. We will uh, reply back. And uh, we, we try our best to be as interactive as possible, especially when it comes to feedback and suggestions and all that good stuff. So thank you again to Shirley. Thank you again to our esteemed co-host, Chez. And thank you as viewers. We will see you back next week. 
This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.